not familiar with baseball's equation for a player's war, but I know the formula for war of the American soldier. It's duty plus honor plus courage times blood squared equals our freedoms protected. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. And yes, this edition is starts off with a sobering moment and that is the Memorial Day tribute to our players and athletes who have sacrificed their lives for the protection of our freedoms and the, to make this country even greater than it already is. This week, I'd like to focus because sometimes I think we lose it, uh, the whole focus of what the holiday is about. It originally began as Decoration Day until 1968. They changed it to Memorial Day. And then they moved it during the 60s from uh, the day which is supposed to traditionally be honored, uh, honor the, the soldiers who gave their lives May 30th to the last Monday in May. And of course, it turns into a three-day holiday. It kicks off summer festivities, going down to the shore, or the end basically of school is in sight. All things good about the summer vacation and about that special freedom. That really summer is the season of freedom when you think about it. But I also want everyone to realize that our soldiers have really protected our rights. And there should be a remembrance of that and, and at least a thought in mind as we are heading into the summer about the sacrifices and contributions that our soldiers have made for uh, this country. So I wanna focus on some of the athletes who either were unfortunately killed in action or did serve in the military, either it was World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, or wars uh, past then. First, uh, I wanna, actually have a shout out to the NHL players as well, because our neighbors to the North have also contributed to World War I and World War II specifically. They've had a number of great players, specifically Hall of Famers who did serve uh, in World War I and World War II. And I'm just going to highlight maybe one or two because I do want to spend my focus on our American soldiers. But it was just a, just a, a, actually a, by sheer luck, I found some of these uh, photos of a guy by the name of Doug Harvey. And Harvey, of course, played for Montreal. He's a Hall of Famer. He did play for the Rangers for a number, uh, a couple of seasons, about two or three. And then he finished up his career with the Blues. And, of course, I had to put, put that Blues uh, top hockey card in because anybody who knows me from Park Ridge sports history in the past know that I love hockey uniforms, and I particularly like the simplified version of the St. Louis Blues with the blue and the piping in yellow and all the rest of it. This one is from the 67-68 season. Harvey, his last year as an as a player in the league. And the reason why I accentuate player in the league is that when I was going through his stats and his career, he was a defensive player. And of course, I only really followed hockey 70-71. And as I've mentioned in the past, the only real card I remember collecting was Danny Grant of the Minnesota North Stars. And he's always stuck out because, as I've said in past shows, he had an allergy to the uniform and had to get his own uniform tailored and uh, sewn for him. That was different material than his North Stars teammates. Anyway, Harvey is a Hall of Famer, wins a couple of cups. And I didn't realize this until I focused on uh, just a, a couple of statistics about him. He is the Norris winner, which is for the best defensive player. And then I, I was looking and saw that he finished second runner-up uh, in the Hart Trophy in 1961 and 62, but not with Montreal, while with the Rangers. And so I did some further investigation. And of course, again, I'm not the biggest hockey fan. I don't know all of the nuances of the game, nor do I know all the stats and the math and, you know, the players that are involved, maybe just a, a gloss over of some of the great players of all time. And I am reintroducing myself to the game because sometimes you, uh, 
because of other obligations, you have to really decide what sports you're going to follow the most. And for me, it's college football, baseball, and college football for the most part. And hockey, of course, I usually follow with the Stanley Cup, all things, and usually gets you through the end of the year or the school year, April to May and then into June. So it's kind of fun to look forward to that. Anyway, Harvey finished runner-up in the Hart Trophy. And then when I was digging a little bit more, I, I didn't realize this. Not only was he second in the Hart Trophy to Jacques Plante, who was the goalie, great goalie Hall of Famer for the Montreal uh, Canadiens, but he coached the Rangers that year. It was his first and only year that he coached. And he had the Rangers finish 26, 32, and 12. And like me, as soon as I saw that, I said, that's pretty good because growing up, the Rangers and the Bruins were terrible. 50s and 60s, they never qualified. Or if they did, it was one, but never both. And for the most part, the Bruins and the Rangers always fought each other for fifth place so they wouldn't finish in the cellar of the NHL. Anyway, uh, Doug Harvey leads the Rangers only six games under 500. They do lose in the first round, which is called the semifinals, which you could also say is the final four for the NHL. They lose in six games to the Toronto Maple Leafs. So he did a remarkable job. And what I'm glad about is the writers, and I'm just looking at this from afar and, of course, from many seasons past 62, many years past. So I have the benefit of history to look into this. But you got to give the writers credit that they recognize what Harvey really accomplished with the Rangers that year, that even though he doesn't win, he is given the respect that, hey, he coached, he comes over from Montreal. A lot of guys would probably say, oh, man, let me just hang it up. Uh, I'm going from first to worst. And uh, it was probably a real agonizing kind of few years there for Doug Harvey. But many times, just like in, in baseball, Hockey does this quite a bit. We'll we'll trade for an aging veteran from a a good team or a team that's going to go into the rebuilding phase. And they wind up, let's say, on a potential playoff team or a team that has lost a number of times uh, by getting close to the cup final but can't get over the hump. And Harvey seemed to fit this role. Problem is that the Rangers, they get him and – he really did a remarkable job for the three seasons. Now, he only coached the one year, and then he finishes his career uh, with the uh, Blues. But like I said, served in World War II admirably. And um, I, I just wanted to put a shout-out for Doug Harvey. And, of course, there were other Hall of Famers for hockey that served in the war. One of them was Hap Day. Of course, here's a picture of him as a general manager or in the front offices of uh, the Maple Leafs. I did have – Another picture of him, maybe it's right here, and they had it as a commemorative uh, ticket for the Maple Leafs to start off their 1998 season, I do believe, maybe their first home game. So they did a little bit of nostalgia. There he is in the Toronto Maple Leafs uniform. A lot of stripes there on those Maple Leaf uniforms. And then, of course, Con Smith and his son also served in the military. In fact, Con Smith was a Hall of Famer more as an executive in hockey, served not just in World War I, but World War II. And I can't go anywhere without <laughs> really mentioning <laughs> the Kraut line, which would never go in today's political correctness uh, theater. But these were three Boston players. They were responsible for quite a few goals as uh, in their seasons. It was Milt Schmidt, Woody Dumart, and, of course, Bobby Bauer. They uh, accomplished quite a bit as a front line. They, they basically were together from 37 all the way to 1947 and served in the military 1943 and 1944 and then come back into the league for the 45-46 season. Bauer actually scored, uh, had a high of 52 points, Schmidt 62, and... Um, Dumart also 52. Good players, but uh, they did serve and fight against the Nazis in uh, Germany for uh, Canada. Now, turning to baseball and all things football, I would like to mention, I'm going to save the baseball for last. I want to spend a little bit more time on that. 
I do want to go to, I guess, probably our most famous right now soldier who was killed in action. And of course, it was by, unfortunately, friendly fire. And that was Pat Tillman. And Tillman, all right, played for the Cardinals. Tillman, of course, was pick number 226 out of 241 in the draft of 2004. I couldn't believe how low he was. He does make an all-pro NFL team. Uh, in fact, the great Sports Illustrated writer Paul Zimmerman named him to his team, uh, his 2000 NFL All-Pro team. And uh, he finished with 155 tackles, 120 solo, one and a half sacks, two forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, nine pass deflections, one interception for 30 yards. And then he enlists. And the uh, interesting thing is with Pat Tillman is uh, he had turned down a multi, multi-million dollar contract with the Arizona Cardinals and, in fact, enlisted in the Army. I believe he comes an Army Ranger. But I wonder how many of us would sacrifice for our – well, would turn down basically uh, a multi-million dollar deal and forever comforts in the United States – and enlist in the army and fight for our freedoms. I don't think too many. Tillman did that. And he gave the he made the ultimate sacrifice in Afghanistan. In fact, I'm just using Wikipedia here. He turned down a $3.6 million contract over three years. $1.2 million a year uh, to enlist in the U.S. Army. And another fellow who enlisted in the U.S. Army, uh, this was probably one, I, I do remember reading the article. He was a Buffalo Bill standout player with the Oklahoma Sooners, and it is Bob Kalsu. And of course, I do remember this cover of Sports Illustrated, and I'm sure I read the article as well. Bob Kalsu. After 1968, he enlisted in the Army, becomes a first lieutenant. Here's the interesting thing about Kalsu. I'm going to keep his picture up there as well. I couldn't find a football card per se of him. This is the closest I got, and I really believe that's not even a Buffalo Bill. I think that might be an AFL, let's say, remember how they did the college all-star? Although I didn't see anything listed on this. He... Like, and I was amazed with Tillman. He, like Tillman, was a low round pick. In fact, Tillman was 226 of 241. Kozlo was pick number 199 by the Buffalo Bills. And just for all uh, you big sports fans out there, Haven Moses was the very first pick for Buffalo in the 68 draft. He was a wide receiver from San Diego State. Bob Tatarek. That's T-A-T-A-R-E-K, Tatarek, of Miami, Florida, was a defensive tackle. He was their uh, Buffalo's next pick. Edgar Chandler of Georgia, an offensive tackle, like uh, Kalsu, an offensive lineman, was chosen uh, with the Bills' third pick. Ben Gregory and Max Anderson were running backs from Nebraska and Arizona, respectively, chosen before Kalsu. The reason why I bring all this up, Kalsu goes on to be the Buffalo Bills Rookie of the Year, named by the team. His number 77, of course, is retired by the Bills, and he served nobly, courageously, bravely in Vietnam. I believe he was killed by mortar fire uh, in 1970. Bob Kalsu played at Oklahoma, and of course, um, Reason I bring up Oklahoma, you know, they've had a number of Heisman Trophy winners and some great offense and defensive linemen. But to me, he's probably the most uh, outstanding of all the Sooners. All right, turning the baseball because I know that many of you baseball fans and look, and oh, by the way, of course, this is as I say, we are getting together. 
Yes, I know. Let's just say in our virtual restaurant, having a hamburger with you and all the rest of it. Uh, things just come to me at once. I did want to make mention of this. I didn't know this, but in 2015, a pitcher by the name of Mitch Harris became the first Navy graduate to surface, no pun intended, in the major leagues. Funny thing is, he was 2-1 and one for the Cardinals that year. Pretty decent ERA, 3-6-7, but never played again in the major leagues. And you're talking now six years ago. That is eons, centuries in a athlete's career. And uh, I don't know why. I'd like to do some further investigation why the uh, Cardinals, he never made the Cardinals again. Does he decide to retire from baseball and concentrate on other things that uh, he may have majored in while at Annapolis? I'm not sure. I'd like to do some further investigation. I was kind of under constraints today because I was really interested in turning. Uh, actually, this began, this project began as just baseball players who served. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Memorial Day is about not the people who served as much as the people who sacrificed their lives. And uh, there were some great players, of course, who served in World War II. You're talking Hank Greenberg, Bob Feller, of course, Ted Williams, of course, Williams had two tours of duty, and that was he was in World War II and also Korea. And the one in Korea, his plane is shot down, I believe, behind enemy lines. And he was, he'll tell you this, I, uh, if you ever read his autobiography, worried about being taken prisoner by the North Koreans. Fortunately, he got out of that predicament and returned to baseball and played another seven years. And just And we've done Ted Williams here. Remember, I did the opening day. Uh, he has a, <laughs> he has like a 22 game hitting streak on opening day, never didn't get a hit on opening day. And I went back and reinvestigated just incredible on opening day. And I compared him, uh, against the likes of Willie Mays and Gurig and Ruth. And he's right up there on opening day. He was the only one that I saw uh, hall of famer, great hitter, all the rest of it that had a 22 game hitting streak. That's guys, that's really incredible. It really is when you think about it. But Williams, of course, served in two tours of duty. Bob Feller, of course, uh, I believe was in the Navy. Warren Spahn in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, and a number of uh, Gil Hodges was a Marine. And uh, But I really wanted to focus on maybe the footnote people who served and unfortunately were killed in action. And I found three players in particular that I'd like to highlight. One is a player uh, that, and this is he, I'm going to save this one. I'm going to, I'm going to cut this in half here. This is Harry O'Neill. Now I was doing some investigation on Harry O'Neill. He plays one game. He plays one game with the Philadelphia A's. I did look for the season 1939. I went through about half of it and I, I had to broadcast the show. Had to get started on this. He never got an at-bat. Never got a walk. Just in one game. So obviously he's a defensive replacement. He was a catcher. And I was thinking about him as I, I really... And I would, uh, you know, you would still take his career. I kind of equate his appearance in a major league game to that of Dr. Archibald Moonlight Graham. And of course, many people know him as the character, although I had to look it up. I knew it was Burt Lancaster in Field of Dreams. I knew he was called Doc. Didn't realize his full name was Archibald, nicknamed Moonlight Graham. But if you recall in that story, he gets up with the bases loaded and hits a sack fly. So he does drive in a run, but his official total is no at-bats, no hits, but a sack fly. And uh, he, of course, walks off the field to save Kevin Cosner's daughter in the story from choking on a hot dog when she fell from the bleachers. And Cosner was adamant that, no, 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 stay in the game. And he was like, nope, this is what I was uh, born to be, a doc. 
and he never regrets his decision. And the reason why I bring that up, I am sure that Harry O'Neill never regretted his decision to be part of the war effort in World War II. Even though he only has one game in the major leagues. All right. Next guy. Uh, Major Robert Neighbors. B-26 bomber. This picture was taken the day the plane and her crew was lost. All right. So he was obviously in the Army Air Force. His plane was shot down when I was doing some work on that, just doing some interesting stuff. The thing with Bob uh, Neighbors, I, I found this kind of interesting, was that Bob Neighbors played in the major leagues. He was actually from Oklahoma, uh, born November 9th, 1917. He actually has a 0 0.0 war. But in 11 at-bats, he's got two hits. One of them is a home run. This I did look up. And Neighbors got the home run against the White Sox on 9-21-1939. He played for the St. Louis Browns. And I have the game, and I, I thought it would be fun to even do the guy he hit the home run against. It's a fellow by the name of Dale Galehouse, uh, who was pitching for the Red Sox at the time. And uh, the Browns lose the game 6-2. But here's the thing. Neighbors was a shortstop. He was one for three and had a home run and hit the home run in the seventh inning to make it. Uh, a 4-2 ball game. The Red Sox would score two runs. No, actually, a 3-2 game. The Red Sox would score two in the seventh and one in the eighth to seal the deal. But got him closer. Then I was looking up Dale Galehouse. All right. He was 9-10 and 10 that year. That was one of his uh, one wins. He actually has a 22.6 war. And, of course, I know I'm accentuating the war today with both my cartoon and uh, with the whole Memorial Day. I was amazed to find this about him. I, he does serve in, uh, in the military. He was in uh, the U.S. Navy, serves in the military for one year, 1945. The interesting thing, he comes out of the military, even though he's nine games under 500 for his career, actually in the six seasons or, yeah, the six seasons that he returned from the military to baseball, he's actually – and even, he is actually, he finished 21, 32. He finished 40 and 40 in his last five years. He actually came back. You could actually argue a better pitcher. So he was 40 and 40 when he came back, 69 and 78 prior to that. The thing is, he looks like a pretty decent pitcher. I'm not saying that he's an ace, certainly not a Bob Feller, but he was definitely a serviceable pitcher player uh had a 1943 probably his best season in the majors he was 11 and 11 with the browns no less and uh he does play on the browns pennant winning team he goes 9 and 10 with a 312 era but his best season was 1943 overall he had a 277 era he had two pitched 224 innings which would be the most in his career uh, the year prior to that was 192. The year after that with the pennant winning Browns, it was 153. So he's kind of a guy that you would think, hmm, you know, you can win with this kind of guy on a better team and with better players probably behind him. Not a, not a ton of strikeouts, although uh, 1943, he does break uh, into triple digits with strikeouts the first and only time in his career. Doesn't seem uh, to walk all that many guys, you know, basically two to one walks and strikeouts or a little bit more like 1.2 to one in terms of strikeouts to walk. Interesting. But uh, Neighbors hits his first and only home run against Gale House. The Red Sox do win the game. And so this is why I love doing programs like this because 
It adds so much to my investigation of old time players, current players, and just the history of the game that I had never heard of Dale Gale House. I wish I'd gotten a, a picture of him, but I really want to make it all about the players who sacrificed uh, their lives. And of course, uh, Bob Neighbors is one of them. I looked up another fella who never got to the major leagues, and it looked like he was close. Probably would have had a cup of coffee if he didn't have to serve. And that was a fellow by the name of Jim Pinder, <clears throat> who was basically a career minor leaguer, and he was killed in action. But the guy who seems to be maybe the most interesting is a fellow by the name of Elmer Gideon. Now, I was doing some investigation on Elmer, and I found this out. He went, he was a Wolverine. And uh, he was a three-sport athlete, while I believe, while at uh, Michigan. And uh, he was killed during World War II. He flew several missions over the European theater of operations as an officer of the U.S. Army Air Forces. It is kind of amazing, as I'm just doing this, how many of our baseball players seem to be in the Ar Army Air Force. Uh, yeah, Ted Williams, okay? Or many of them like Yogi and Bob Feller go into the Navy. I don't know. It just, I don't know why that just uh, popped up on me. But just, this is from Wikipedia. It was just a quick source that I could find. During college at Michigan, Gideon, uh, or Gideon became an All-American in track and field. He earned varsity levels in football and baseball. I, it, that's incredible that he was a three-sport athlete while in college. I don't care if you're doing it in the 40s or in the 50s. That'll be unheard of now. Maybe you get a two-sport athlete a la a Bo Jackson, and even that's 30 years ago, or a Frank Thomas, but even that, again, is 30 years ago. All right, He tied a world record in high hurdles in 1938. And after, base, after graduating, he had a stint in the major leagues as an outfielder with the Senators. And um, he trained as a bomber pilot, decorated for bravery after his plane crashed on a training flight in 42. He later served in combat and was shot down and killed while piloting a B-26 bomber on a mission over France, April 1944. So this is just before uh, D-Day. Probably, you could argue, he was probably doing a scanning mission, probably mapping out potential places where the Allies could land and probably getting all kinds of intel on where the Germans were situated, all the rest of it. His awards, Soldier's Medal, and the Purple Heart served as a captain in the 586 Bomb Squadron, 394th Bombardment Group. He's actually buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Now, for his baseball career, this is what is interesting about him. He has 15 at-bats in baseball history. He actually finishes with a negative 0.1 war. And maybe he does that for baseball. To me, he's 101 war for his war uh, heroics. No home runs. He had three hits, 15 at-bats. One RBI, one run scored. So what do I do? I kind of look up his unbelievable <laughs> one game in the major leagues. And I would take this in a heartbeat. While with Washington at the age of 22, he, on 9-19-39, it's amazing. They both players that I was talking about come up in late September. So they're September call-ups. But on September 19th, 1939, not only does he have his first hit, he has all three hits in his only game. And I'm even starting to think, as I'm saying that to you right now, I wonder if that's some sort of a record. Uh, the most hits by a player, uh, you, you know, basically the only hits a player has in his career how many guys had him all in one game? He just might be the only guy to do that because it was, that's pretty uh, interesting that Gideon, uh, Gideon uh, was three for four center fielder. He had a run scored, a walk. 
And uh, no, he do- he didn't drive in a run in that game, but he had a run scored. He had, I believe, his first hit against a fellow by the name of Harry Eisenstadt. Now, Harry Eisenstadt, here's his career. Pretty interesting. Actually, here just giving you a little rundown of this game. It was Washington versus Cleveland. He was playing for Washington, and the pitcher on the mound for the Senators was a fellow by the name of Early Wynn, who actually threw two wild pitches in the game. Harry Eisenstadt, or Eisenstadt, had a 6-8 career war, certainly lower than uh, Gale House's. He was 25-27, and 3-8-4 ERA, maybe a little high for the time that he was in. He does have one good season, I would consider, and that was with Detroit 1938. He was 9 and 6 with a 373 ERA. Again, played eight years, managed eight years. And actually, according to baseball reference, that 9 and 6 season is probably close to what his 162 game average would be. Uh, baseball reference has it 9 and 9, 481 winning percentage with a 384 ERA. Detroit. The funny thing is, like uh, the other players before him, he's with Detroit in 1938. In 1939, he's with Detroit, and uh, they finished fifth. The next year, he's no longer with them, and guess what? Detroit makes the World Series and loses to the Cincinnati Reds in seven games. So he's another guy who... <laughs> who stayed a little too uh, too short a time with the one team. In fact, that 1940 team, ready for this, that 1939 team had Hank Greenberg. Man, he was a masher. Great player, really. Drew a ton of walks. He is definitely uh, a player that would equate to today's game. And, and the reason I'm going to stay on Greenberg is that he also, uh, I believe he led – in his final season of play, he led the league in walks. Here's Hank Greenberg, his stats. He was not, he was, he missed three years, 42, 43, 44. He was in the U.S. Army Air Force. Again, his final season, yes, he actually leads the league in walks. He only hit 249 that year, Greenberg, but he had a 408 uh, on base percentage. And for a guy who is 36 years old, this is the kind of year he gives you. In 125 games, 25 home runs, 74 RBIs, 104 walks, 249 batting average, but a 408 on base percentage. He scored 71 runs. This is Greenberg. Greenberg, I, I know that people like to talk about that 58, uh, his 58 home run performance in 1938. Greenberg, though, I think this is pretty impressive. I know the home runs are great, and we'll do another show on home runs and all the rest of it. Greenberg, ready for this? Outside of 1936, I think he got hurt. He only played 12 games that year. Greenberg, for one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, in five of the six seasons, averaged 42 doubles or more. Uh, from 1934 to 1940, with the exception, of course, of 36, where he only played 12 games. He had a high 63 doubles at age 23. 63 doubles. I know everybody always talks about the home runs. 63 doubles. He had 96 extra base hits that year, 1934. He was 63, seven triples, 26 home runs. So he's probably just really learning how to hit, if you know what I mean. And then he, he really matures as a hitter. I'll tell you why in a second. Still had 139 RBIs, drew 63 walks, had an on-base percentage of 404. I will tell you this, Greenberg uh, walked over 90 times. Actually, I'm going to bring it down a little bit. He walked over 80 times in two, four, six, seven seasons that he played. He only played 13 years. And you wonder, by baseball reference standards, he, he he was over 162 games, 35, 148, 313 batting average. So even if you kind of bring that down a little bit and say, 
You know, he never played 162 games. His high was 155. Let's just say we take 20% off those 38 home runs. So now we just give him a flat 30 home runs. That's another 90 home runs he would have had, which would have given him over 400 for his career. And 120, uh, 148 RBIs, that's incredible. Here's, man, he was a masher. Greenberg, 139, 168. Uh, forget 1936, 184, 147, 113. And that's a down year in RBIs. 150. And then, of course, he's called up to the military in 1941 after 19 games. In five years, man, he mashed the ball. He averaged, woof, better than, I will tell you this, 84, probably if he took 30 off that, Ford, he averaged better than 145 RBIs a year for five years going in a season where they only played 154 games. That's incredible, Hank Greenberg. Okay? Now, Elmer Gideon, and just getting back to it, he's only an all-star four times, uh, Greenberg. But that was really before everything else. Two-time MVP, Greenberg. And you know what? I'm going to stay on Greenberg a little bit because uh, MVP twice, finished third twice. And the years that he finished third were back-to-back. He was 26 and 27 in 1938 and 39. Finished uh, third to ready for this. Joe DiMaggio was second. Charlie Geringer was a fellow Detroit teammate. Uh, finish first. I would say this, probably lefty Gomez. Now remember, they're not giving it to pitchers as much. He finishes with the high war of nine. DiMaggio is 8.2. Greenberg and Geringer both finish uh, 7.5 and 7.7 respectively. But Greenberg, mm, tough, tough year to lose. Here was DiMaggio's well, here was Geringer's stats, 1496, 371, 458 on-base percentage. Here's the Maggio's, 46, 167, 346, 412 on-base percentage. And then here's Greenberg, 40, 184, 102 walks, 337 batting average, a 436 on-base percentage. Incredible. That was 1937. I believe the Yankees, uh, well, DiMaggio, of course. Man, DiMaggio was incredible too, guys. Just incredible. Uh, the Yankees, of course, win the World Series four games to one over the Giants. And probably the reason why Detroit, they finished second, a full 13 games out behind the Yankees in 1937. Then, again, Detroit and Greenberg, they finish. He finishes third again in the uh, running. Greenberg at age 28 in 1939, at the age of 28, he finished uh, 18th in it. Uh, let me go back to 1938. He finished MVP. He was third. He finished behind Jimmy Fox and Bill Dickey. His war that year was 6.7. Jimmy Fox 7.6. Probably should have finished second, all right, to Bill Dickey. But again, the Yankees win, so it makes it kind of tough. Dickey does have a, a good season, 27, 115, 313 batting average with a 412 on base percentage. Fox was a beast, 50, 175, 349, drew 119 walks, had an on base percentage of 462. And Greenberg, mm, 58, 147. 119 walks, 315 BA, and a 438 on base percentage. <laughs> Incredible for both of them. And of course, Greenberg serves in the military, the Army Air Force. DiMaggio, another guy who I mentioned, was also in the military. Uh, and uh, just, inc just incredible. I know a lot of guys love to talk about Bob Feller. Remember, he enlists in the Navy right after Pearl Harbor, 1941. He's just another great player, just another unbelievable American. All these guys that I'm mentioning. And I know I, I might be kind of glossing over the men that uh, gave their lives, the men that 
gave their lives in uh, the war effort. Bobby Neighbors. I mean, look at these guys. They're kids. They're kids. Of course, this is uh, baseball in wartime. I do love these cards. And look what it says. Ultimate Sacrifice. Those are kind of cool uniforms too, by the way. Baseball uniforms with the white sleeves that many of the players wore. I will tell you this. They look handsome in their uniforms. But they look handsome even in their Army fatigues or best Army uniforms. When I was a kid, I used to wear my tie inside like that too, just to kind of mimic the military. Our Memorial Day special, we honor the brave who have fallen, giving their lives in the war effort, defending this country and its values. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports History. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.